at the tell it's treat your mind Keep the door, y'all Let your light shine Elevate your mind You know it's only right I got the time If you got the time it's treat your mind Keep the door, y'all Let your light shine Elevate your mind You know it's only right Shalom, Israel Shalom to the Akayim um, I'm just bringing out the topic to show, you know what I'm saying, that we as the uh, slaves or the, 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 the descendants of the slaves here in America showing that we are the seed of Israel, we are the Israelites, you know, and uh, there's plenty ways you can show this, you know, there's plenty of evidence now that people should be able to see. Uh, I'm going to read this article off. It say Africans did not sell their own people into slavery. And that's the truth. And that's the truth because we are not the African race. We we not African. You know, we the Hebrew Israelites from the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we're gonna go from this article, we're gonna read from this article, you know, and, and we're gonna see what the African man says, you know, himself. All right, and, and then I got a couple videos that I'm going to link to this also. All right, so with that, we're going to go into it. All right, so we're going to read it. It says, even, even, even in this modern world, there are wars and rumors of war almost everywhere you go. There was wars in Europe in those days, and there was wars in America. There were wars almost everywhere in the world. There were tribal wars in Africa too. The difference between the tribal wars in Africa and the wars in the outside world was that in the outside world, the conquered were often butchered, whereas conquered in Africa, excluding Arabs, Muslims, and the North, became part of the conqueror. In other words, while no enemy was left standing in the outside world, the conquered enemies were left, be, were left to live and serve in Africa. So it is true there were slaves in Africa in those days before the white man came. See that? So it was slaves in Africa before the white man came. But they didn't kill the slaves, according to the article. Alright, it says, however, those slaves were not taken by force purposely to become slaves of another kingdom or empire. Empire. They were just victims of tribal wars, and it was better than what was happening in the outside world where no enemy was allowed to live. See that? So, in the outside world, outside of Africa, see, so this also shows that when they're talking about worlds, it's different type of worlds that they could be talking about. See there? Because the African man had his own type of world that he lived in. And, and that's why they call it outside world. Because it's outside of Africa. The, the African kingdom. Alright? They say, you know, they were just victims of tribal wars inside of Africa. And it was better than what, what was happening in the outside world where no enemy was allowed to live so in Africa the slave or the enemy was allowed to live right say so I read an article online today and I was shocked to read so many people believe Africans sold their own brothers and sisters into slavery just like that my teachers and sources taught me something quite different I wanted to comment comment on the article but the comment section had been disabled so I couldn't comment and that is why I'm making this post so to let people know that the, that we Africans see it. So it's the African who speak say that we Africans weren't that stupid to have sold our own brothers and sisters into slavery just like that. We were stupid to have allowed ourselves to be manipulated by foreigners. My people used to refer as the white man as white strangers. So pardon me if you see a white stranger stranger in my post. We were stupid to have trusted the white stranger in the place in the first place and we were stu stupid to have allowed the white stranger into our land. People allowed the white strangers into our land because they the white strangers said they come in peace. See? So 
another thing when, when you're talking about, you know what I'm saying, Edom, you know, they always say we come in peace, but they peace is always war, you know, but we're going to keep going. It say, before I continue, please note that there were two types of slaves trading in Africa, see, so it's two types of slaves trading in Africa. The one introduced mostly by the coming of Islam through Arabs trading from the north or the Trans-Saharan Saharan slave trade. So it's the, the Arabs, they was trading from the north, you know, or the Trans-Saharan slave trade. And the one introduced by the coming of the Europeans or the Trans-Atlantic slave trade. So it's two different kinds. It's the Trans-Saharan and the Trans-Atlantic. And the Trans-Saharan was with the Iraq Arab and the, uh, the uh, Trans-Atlantic was with the European. The one I'm talking about, the Trans-Saharan slave trade is deeply rooted in the Islamic culture of several countries, especially in the North and still practiced throughout silently by Islamic countries such as Mauritania. According to my grandfather, in those days when there were no Christianity, see, no modern day government systems in Africa, kings, queens, or other traditional rulers ruled the kingdoms as heads of state and judged cases according to the rules and regulations of the land. So when there was no Christianity or government systems, the kings and the queens is who ran the, who ruled the land, you know? And they judged according to the rules and regulations of the land. Check this out. Those who obeyed the laws of the land were punished. Those who shallot. Those who disobeyed the laws of the land were punished. And those who obeyed and sacrificed for the land were rewarded accordingly. Throughout every land had shallot. Although every land had some prison facilities, those prisons weren't meant for large groups of criminals. So those who killed were killed, and those who stole paid dearly for it. Those who slept with other people's wives were banished from the land. Children who disobeyed elders were punished accordingly, and so on. See, so that's kind of similar right there to the, what the Torah teaches. It's kind of similar, right? All right. Now check this out, say, my country Ghana. So right there, also again, he's showing you that this is an African person So this, the, that put this post up. So this is from the mind of an African, all right? Not an African, uh, so-called African-American or an Israelite man, but it's an Af a, a actual African man, all right? So it's a... My country, Ghana, and West Africa was a major slave trading post, headquarters, see, where slaves were different parts of Africa were brought and arranged before tripping, shipping abroad. When the white strangers came first to Africa, we, my ancestors, were not sure about their intentions, so most communities drove them away from the land but the white strangers managed to convince some of our traditional rulers that had that they had not come to cause harm, but just come to preach the good news. See, their Bible. And also to trade with the local people. Some of the local chefs along with along the coast started accepting the white strangers by giving them place giving them place to stay. The white strangers started building missionary centers where they stayed and preached the gospel and they and also traded with local people. However, the white strangers later on expanded those missionary centers, including churches and caterums, into forts and castles where they packed slaves before shipping them abroad. See, this is what happened. See there? One more time. The white strangers started building missionary centers where they stayed and preached the gospel. See that? So they was preaching their Bible, you know? Their gospel, the gospel of Paul, right? And they also traded with local people. 
However, the white strangers later on, see, that's how they got in. But later on, they expanded their, they expanded those missionary centers, including churches and cathedrals, into forts and what cathedrals where they packed slaves before shipping them abroad. See there? So, see, so this is what happened, right? White, the white strangers did not understand the lang the local language, and the local people did not understand a word the white strangers were saying, so it made communication very difficult. To help break the language barrier, the white strangers went to local rulers and asked the local rulers to give them some of the local people to train so they could not so they could speak the foreign language language which would make communication easier but no one up but no one of those local rulers were ready to give their people out to go stay with strangers see so the african people wasn't finna get a own families and people up to the strangers you know to go live with now check this out say later on some of the local rulers came up with an idea instead of killing those criminals so instead of killing criminal so-called criminals they would actually they would they could actually give those criminals to the white strangers so the white strangers could preach good news they said they came to preach to those criminals and also train them in the foreign language in order to aid communication which was better than killing those animals I mean criminals, Shalak, better than killing those criminals. So they saying that they gonna teach them the good news, their gospel of Paul, right? Their Bible, right? And instead of killing them, they gonna train them in, a, in their language, you know, so they can better communicate with the African instead of killing the so-called criminals, right? Then it says, so the traditional rulers gave those criminals out to the white strangers. And to show appreciation, those white strangers gave gifts like bottles of wine, mirrors, etc. See, to traditional rulers, that that how was that was how the white strangers got their first local service. See, so at this time they were still living there with the African, right? And they was local serv service. You know, the so-called criminals was local servers to the white strangers at the time. Check this out. It say those local people, the criminals, lived and served the white strangers in the castles and forts and learned the foreign language which enabled them to serve as mediators translating the local language for the white strangers and the foreign language to the local people. See there? This helped a lot in communication. As I mentioned earlier on, those local servants living with the white strangers were the criminals in the society. And although they serve as mediators and make communication a whole lot easier, they also made life a living hell for the local people. Some as, as a form of revenge. For example, the white strangers sent them to go collect taxes let's say five pieces of gold. Those criminals added their own taxes and made it eight pieces of gold at times to mistranslate just so they could get more power. Some of those criminals even became more powerful than the traditional rulers. In other words, the white strangers, after preaching the good news to those criminals, turned them into even more, even far more dangerous monsters white because only the white men had guns at that time and they and they shot any one and they shot anyone the criminals considered criminals see that hold on those criminals were the few africans who helped the white strangers get more slaves however don't forget the fact that they were they were criminals condemned to death in their various society for being un african See there? Now one more time. So y'all can get an understanding of what I just said. Alright? Check it out. Those criminals, 
See, the whole time they've been calling these so-called slaves to the African man, who the slave, who the African man gave as as slaves to the. Uh, actually, they was called servants at this time. They were servants of the African man, and they gave them to the the white what they call the white strangers as servants at this time, you know? So, they gave, they called them criminals, but they were servants, because they was, uh, uh, they was actually, uh, 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 they called them what, uh, criminals of war, I believe that's what they called them at this time, because this is like after 70 AD, after the fall of Jerusalem. And that's how they got over here. That's, but let's check it out. Say those criminals were the few Africans who helped the white strangers get more slaves. However, don't forget the fact that they were they were criminals condemned to death in various societies for being what? Un African. See that? So this man who's they the, the so called African man that they call that they call it criminals, he's condemned to death in certain societies for being an African. So he's not an African. All right, so we got that established. Check this out. Those local people living in, living with the white strangers served and worshiped them as well to put, as Shalak. Those local people living with the white strangers served and worshiped them so well to the point where the white strangers began asking for more. See? So they were so good servants to the white strangers that the white strangers started asking for more because of the benefits they derived from those local servers. See, some of the white strangers took some local servers with them and returned home, back home abroad. See, so they went back abroad. These, they found those local servers, the black men from Africa, see, so the so-called black man from Africa, who's who's un-African, see, they found those local servers, see, the black men from Africa, who's what, un-African. So let's get it. Very useful and decided to come back for more. They realized they could use them to work on their plantation farms back home to make more money. They also realized they could sell some of them, some of those local services to their friends and relatives to make more money. And that was, and that's what why they, that was why most of them, the white strangers, but this time around slave traders, returned to, return with the intention of picking more local service. This time around slaves. They, so they returned for slaves, but no local ruler was ready to sell their people out except for the, except those criminals, see? Except for those so-called criminals. These some Israelites. Say, I mentioned earlier on the, on the prisoners of war, tribal wars. In my country, for example, the Ashantis and those living in the and the interior parts of the country did not want to have anything to do with the white strangers. In fact, the first white strangers set, that set foot on the Ashanti Empire did not return. See there? However, the white strangers needed slaves and more slaves, but there was no easy way of getting slaves in Africa. So they, so what they did was that so what they did was that they created confusion among the various tribes so that they were so that there would be more tribal wars and more war prisoners so they could get more slaves and prisoners of war and that was exactly what they did as time went on the white strangers started supplying some of the local warriors most of the most of them criminals with guns to enable them to enable them wound and capture more more war prisoners for them and in return the white strangers started giving those local warriors gifts to encourage them catch more prisoners of war for for them see so now it's even showing you that they prisoners of war 
please note my people were not already please note my people were not ready to give their own brothers and sisters out into slavery rather the white strangers were the ones who did demon not demon demonically manipulated my people by creating so much confusion confusion between the various tribes and creating so many tribal wars all all in an effort to get slaves see so it's showing you that the white strangers were the ones who de demonically manipulated the African people by creating so much confusion between the various tribes and create so many tribal wars in an effort just to get more slaves see there and say the more tribal conflicts the white strangers created the more slaves they got so those white strangers created even more confusion among tribal tribal groups and communities in my country for example because the Ashanti Empire was so powerful to defeat the white strangers created so much confusion confusion and so many wars between the Ashantis and the neighboring tribes and in some cases supplied some of those neighboring tribes with guns to enable them to defeat the Ashanti. See there? The white strangers continued this until they were able to defeat the Ashantis and took away the king of the Ashantis, Nana Prapa, and the queen mother, Nana Ya Ashatawa and several others into exile just to break the Ashanti kingdom apart even after slavery so they could colonize and control the Ashanti gold etc. To conclude we Africans did not sell our brothers and sisters into slavery just like that. We were deceived and demonically manipulated by those white strangers who visited our land and the most painful part is that some of our people were so blind to see which is very sad look see and now you know it's showing you that the African man he was manipulated into selling his servants to the uh, to the European man you know and that was his own ignorance but he did it you know what I'm saying and uh, it's showing you, you know, that the European at the time was staying over there in Africa. You know? So it's a pretty good article, man. It's right here, you know. Uh, it's right here. It's the African. I can't really see. Hold on. Let me see. See, it's called Africa and the World. You know, that's what, that's what it's called. Africa and the World. And then I typed in uh, Africans did not sell their own people into slavery. All right, but they knew who they was who they was giving away. They knew they was giving away the Israelites, the Israelite man. This is what this article tells us: the Africans did not sell their own people into slavery. They sold us, the Israelites. You know, and and the thing about the Ashanti tribe is. You know, a lot of people believe that the Ashanti tribe is Israelites. And uh, I think one of my friends, you know, uh, B. Bainaman, he did a little research to where I believe it's the Ashanti tribe that he was, he was telling me that he found through his research that they Israelites. You know, but that's, that's what happened, you know. When, when they they was in Africa, it was about the tribal wars within Africa, you know. And then you know Edom always been the master confusion, you know, the master manipulator. He demonized the people, you know. He manipulated. His being what he is, you know. That's that's his craft, though. You know. So with that, you know, we're going to go to this video right quick to, to further show this proof and evidence, you know, that we, the so-called, the, the so-called African-American, we are the Hebrew Israelite man by blood. This is not a religion. This is blood, you know. 
and this truth is coming out. Hallelujah. The African was not in the slave trade. The African was not in the slave trade. Trade. The African was not in the slave trade. It disgraced Islam. In East Africa, the Arabs have already disgraced Islam. They had started a slave trade 600 years before the European. In this, this slave trade, after they lost Spain, preying on nations in Africa, had drained Africa of so much time and energy and resources and organization, the African now could not mount an offense against Europe. Now that the nature of African servitude one to the other had no relationship to the slave trade, that the slave trade was the greatest holocaust, the greatest drainage on a people in the history of the world. Africans had no ships that he could connect three continents. And even if the African was in the slave trade, he could not have brought it off. He didn't have a ship that would hold a hundred people. Seeing Africans were right in imprisoning their slave, their, their, in holding their prisoners of war and making their prisoners of war work for them. Well, that's better than killing them, but and making that prisoners of war work for them, Africans were right in imprisoning their slave, their, their, in holding their prisoners of war and making their prisoners of war work for them, imprisoning their slave, their, their, in holding their prisoners of war and making their prisoners of war work for them. You see, the enemies that we, the Arabs that we had installed in Spain in the Mediterranean, because the military arm was African, turning on us. Now this is bigger than my skimpy explanation because every ally we ever had has turned on us. When it was his or her convenient to do so. Left are right and there is no exception now the arabs have turned on the africans moved out from north africa and destroyed the great nation states in inner africa now they will increase the slave trade along the coast of west africa the portuguese and the Spaniards. Africa is in a bind now. East Africa is controlled by Arab slave traders. North Africa is controlled by Africans and Arabs returning from the conquest of Spain under the law of Spain. West Africa is arguing among themselves because they came to sell their family dispute. They will make a, a, a mistake by inviting the Portuguese to arbitrate their family dispute. Now I've said this before, if you didn't learn anything from Godfather 1 and 2, you never, absolutely never, invite an outsider to settle a family dispute. Never. Sober up old drunken Uncle Willie. <laughs> Let him settle it. But it must be somebody from within the family. Now the African is in a bind by the European. Now let us explain something that a whole lot of people have got misconceptions about, whether the African had slavery before the Europeans. In the European sense, no. Servitude is not slavery. They had worse servitude here in the United States, whites against whites. Many times the Africans in wars or difficulties would capture other African groups. 
these groups would have to work their way out of indenture, either tending cattle or doing something. Some groups built up a surplus of labor. The Africans had no big ships to take from Africans down the coast. So he knew a king further down who needed some labor. Now that the Portuguese are there, he hired some of the Portuguese to take these Africans from one part of Africa and another. Now the European is interpreting this as being the African was in the slave trade. The African was not in the slave trade and you let people beat you over the head with nonsense because you have not studied African culture to understand that the nature of African servitude one to the other had no relationship to the slave trade, that the slave trade was the greatest holocaust, the greatest drainage on a people in the history of the world. Africans had no ships that he could connect three continents and even if the African was in the slave trade, he could not have brought it off. He didn't have a ship that would hold a hundred people along the coast. Mostly big fishing boats and river boats. So he could never have brought off anything as massive as the western slave trade. Couldn't have done it if he wanted to didn't have the facility anyway. I am not saying Africans were right in imprisoning their slave, their, their, in holding their prisoners of war and making their prisoners of war work for them. Well, that's better than killing them, but I'm saying that they made a symbolic mistake and a tactical mistake when they hired the Portuguese to take captives from one part of Africa to the other and gave the Portuguese the illusion that they were in the same trade and had the same intentions for enslavement as the Portuguese. That was a mistake. It was a mistake because we did not know the European culture and we did not know the European mentality. Didn't know it then, don't know it now. Otherwise, you would behave differently. The Africans came from a society that was collective. The European came from a society that was individual. Two kinds of temperaments, two different people. Now, in the Western world, you become selfish, closed-door individuals. You get in your lonely room to think of something to tell your analyst. But if you had some friends, you wouldn't need any analyst. Because African society was so open. If you couldn't talk to anybody else, you can talk to the village gossipers, who was always available. That was a good drain off. <laughs> But we, we, we became a different people in this vine. All right. If the concept of slavery was starting in the world, it was a going concern among the Arabs 600 years before the Europeans, and if there were so many people in the world why the choice of the African as against those other people collectively more numerous than the African? The question is both ancient and current. Why is Africa more exploited right now than any other continent? Why do people willing to fight Africans and not willing to fight others? Why do 
does Israel get more aid than all the African nations in the world put together? One nation and the total population of the Jews. The total world population is less than one half of the black population in the United States. Why do they get so much attention, you get so little attention? They got that political thing together, you haven't got yours together. They got that religious thing together, and that cultural thing together. Religion and culture are servants of a people, and they convert it to service. religion is religion. You don't make enough demands from anything, especially the people who take up your time and your resources. We are the true believers. We out Muhammad, Muhammad, out Pope to Pope. We believe in things in their purest form. They go to the right or the left. They say, go to the center. We go to the center. So now we become the victims of our own culture as the needs of Europe began to expand. Now, let's look at the beginning of the tragedy. Ah, man so with that we're gonna go ahead and go to the video see these when, when I read it I see that I see it's like these Africans they is admitting you know they they know who we is they know they ain't sell their own people you know a lot of people know who we is they know they ain't sell you know what I'm saying no other Africans they know we the Israelites a lot of nations throughout this world, you know, it's just our, our nation is the ones who's lacking knowledge. Like the Torah said, we fall for a lack of knowledge. So we need to get the understanding, you know, to realize who we are, you know what I'm saying, by blood. You know, and realize who we are. And then walk as that nation, you know. Get that wisdom, get that knowledge, get that understanding. And walk accordingly. You know, to our, to our, to our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know what I'm saying? Who was righteous in the eyes of the Most High? That's why they the stand out now. You know, that's you. You know, you that righteous nation. You that righteous man. You know. But like when you look at the story of Job, you know. That 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 man of 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 suffering, you know, that's what that's what it's showing. The that that it's real, it's real as a nation. We we get trialed, you know. We go through trials and tribulations, you know, because we turned away from the Most High. So we. Right now we like we being chastised by the most high. We've been and we've been going through chastisement. You know? But it's like we stuck with this blindfold over our eyes. And because we it's like we love our chastisement. You know? But we we was created for a greater purpose. You know? And we gotta live for that purpose which we were created for. You know, so we have to turn back to the truth. We have to turn back to the, the tour, to the reality, you know, and, and to turn to this tour, right, this is, this right here is going to extend your life, you know, to follow it, to walk after it, you know, then you going to extend your life. But if you don't walk after it, you know what I'm saying, you're going to fall with the nation right I mean that's in Zachariah you know so 
And with that, though, we're going to go ahead and get to this video. Extra credit. Here's a very perplexing conundrum I just can't seem to shake. I think of myself as a person that has the ability to know people in situations and something about what was told to us about the African kings selling Africans, especially at the rate in which they were being taken, not only goes against logic, reasoning, and moral conduct, but it also goes against a human anatomy and physiology. Let me explain. There is one thing we all as humans share, and that is raw emotions. There is no way President Obama, African king in this case, can sell my kinsmen to a people I think are ghosts without me coming to do harm to Mr. Obama. I wouldn't care if he had a treaty or not with the Europeans. Wine or no wine, Harlan or no Harlan. Second, with the African trade routes being so vast, how could a caravan that size go their way and conduct their evil business without being accosted and killed by pissed off Africans looking for their kinsmen and revenge? There is only one plausible explanation for this wrinkle in the normal flow of human emotion. The people that were being sold off were not the Africans' kinsmen at all. Look at it from this point of view. The so-called African Americans are who they are, talented and beautiful, yet we still have to shake our heads at them. Why would we think African Americans were any different while they were living in Africa? We can't say it was the institution of slavery because as we just proved, they were slaves all throughout Africa during their stay. It's just my theory, but the truth of the matter is the aboriginal African never sold off his own people in the first place. They sold off the strangers slash refugees slash slaves that were living in their lands they had acquired centuries earlier from the Roman invasion of Jerusalem. Surely resources and tribal disputes had to come into play and who better to get rid of and ease the tension and conflict other than the immigrants living amongst them. Doesn't this sound familiar, America? I am sure if America could sell off some of the African Americans back to the Africans, they would. The only thing is, while being the immigrants, just like in America, they did all the service jobs, meaning they, are, they were truly the skilled workers. They build the houses, plant the food, and make things that others enjoy. This is why the African nations fell off like they did. They sold all of their cheap and affordable for labor force. You know, those who knew how to get things done. Are we to think the white man didn't ask or figure out who was the best of the best before taking them? Really? You don't think Massa actually taught dumb niggers how to build and feed America, do you? Now, that's just the white man taking more credit than he deserves. To prove my point, Africa was once the cradle of knowledge, technology, and agriculture. They sold the so-called African Americans to the Americas. Look at the African continent now, and look at the Americas now. Let me clear two misconceptions up. One, the transatlantic slave trade was the first, second, or third worldwide slave endeavor going on in Africa during uh, or after Kunta Kente. The world had been set, taking slaves from Africa since 70 AD. I dare you the wiki of Google slavery in Africa. It will make your eyes fall out. The Africans had been selling the Israelites to each other and the known world for quite some time. The second thing I wanted to clear up is the thought that the indigenous Yoruba and Igbo were victims in the slave trade. Black is black and a nigger is a nigger to other people of the world and they mistakenly saw the sheer number of quote unquote Africans coming from those areas and thought they were aboriginal to the area. No, the Yoruba and the Igbo plus eight others were the central hub for the indigenous intercontinent slave trade. That's slave trade among Africans. That is why for, for catching slaves was so easy for the white man and Arabs. The Africans already had a slave system in place, way before 70 AD, might I add. The people of that region who 
can claim to be of the ancient Israelites were the slaves of the slave runners. Thus, why they were able to stay behind while the others were sold away. How else can you possibly explain how people can march from one side of the continent to the other without African tribes who knew they were going to be next attacking the rocks? How else can you possibly explain how the world was able to penetrate the interior in the first place without being attacked by much larger African tribes? Because they were only doing what the Aboriginal Africans had set up centuries earlier. How did the world know where to get fresh water supplies and supplies for the long and supposedly unknown interior journey ahead? The African trader, the African trader posts along the rocks. That's how. Think about it logically and logistically for a minute. Y'all had to scatter the Israelites throughout a large area first that the world, all the nation, could simply come one by one and pick them up and take them back to their land and their colonies. And he used the vast African trade route system to do it. I'm going to close this theory out with a question I have asked many people in the past few months with no success, so I will ask you. Don't you find it odd that African American men can grow beards and African men cannot? I know you want to say the Europeans introduced it in our bloodline, but just think about thinking about that theory on the surface makes me laugh. No, they didn't rape every slave. Massa still had a wife and children. Outside of New Orleans, it happened, but it was still frowned upon in the South. Remember, it was best for him to get the big back, big black buck and a big black woman to have a big black baby. Now add this fact into your equation. At least nine European world powers have control of the slave trade in Africa. And I don't think only the American white male rape or had consensual sex with this property. If the European beard theory is true, shouldn't there be bearded Africans all over the place? Thank you for listening to this one, and as always, look for the next one. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in caves just like this one above me. In cave one, the scrolls were found in earthenware jars, and so they were very well preserved. In cave four, they were found just scattered about on the floor. They were not as well preserved, but there were over 500 found in that one cave alone. These caves contained anywhere from a single fragment to a few dozen manuscripts. Cave three contained the famous Copper Scroll, a map listing what seems to be 64 different sites where gold and silver treasures and sacred objects were hidden. So far, no one has successfully deciphered it. Another famous site was Cave 11, where the last of the scrolls was discovered. The greatest find here was the Temple Scroll, the longest of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It essentially rewrites the law and offers details concerning religious regulations pertaining to the Temple in Jerusalem. The Dead Sea Scrolls date from about 250 BC until the middle of the first century AD. They were written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Copying these documents was a long and laborious task. Excavators identified one room at the site as the location where scrolls were produced. This identification was made partly on the basis of the discovery of inkwells. Because inkwells are so rare, it suggests that this was where the scrolls were copied or at least assembled. Scholars have identified this room as a scriptorium. This is where the Jewish scribes would have put together the books we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. If we were to go back in time, we could imagine long tables filled with individual pages waiting for the scribes to stitch them together. But why were the scrolls hidden in the caves? The belief is that the community here hid them shortly before the Roman army advanced upon the area. The first Jewish-Roman war took place in AD 66 to 73. In AD 66, the Roman general Vespasian was appointed by Emperor Nero to suppress the Jewish revolt. 
He oversaw Roman military operations until he left for Rome in AD 69 to become emperor. Vespasian left his son Titus in charge. Titus presided over the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The arch commemorating this victory still stands in Rome today, showing Roman forces carrying off treasures from the temple in Jerusalem. Qumran was destroyed by the Roman army in AD 68, but residents had already hidden the scrolls for safekeeping. Some of the caves could only be accessed from within the community, so it seems the inhabitants fully intended to come back to reclaim the scrolls, but they weren't able to do so. And so the scrolls remained hidden until their discovery in 1947. Today, the majority of the scrolls may be found in the Israel Museum, although a few are held in private collections around the world. The centerpiece of this collection is a replica of the copy of Isaiah discovered in Cave 1. The great Isaiah scroll is housed in the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem. It was one of the very best preserved of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this copy of Isaiah's prophecy was produced a century before the birth of Christ, and yet it contains centuries-old messianic prophecies about his birth, his life, and his death. When we consider the value of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can hardly overestimate their contribution to our understanding of the Bible. The manner in which the Jews copied ancient scrolls ensured that they would have reliable manuscripts that were faithful to the originals. Prior to the discovery of the scrolls, the earliest copies of the books of the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, dated to the Middle Ages. Prior to the late 1940s, the oldest Hebrew manuscript of the Old Testament scriptures was the Aleppo manuscript that dated to roughly A.D. 935. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls date to the first and second century before Christ. Now, that's quite a difference in terms of time, and so that gave the skeptic and the critic really some ammunition to use uh, in regard to the Bible. Number one, they would argue that the prophecies were written after the fact, that is, those prophecies about Jesus. And number two, because of this long time span, that the Bible somehow had changed over time, that we really didn't have the Bible today that they had prior to the time of Christ. And Five. The typical scholar might have said that we have no way of knowing how accurately the scribes had copied the biblical text. They would have said that it would be impossible to know just how many additions, deletions, or other alterations had been made. With as much as 2,000 years of copying, scholars, and certainly skeptics and critics, would have said that the original text of the Hebrew Bible was completely irrecoverable. Usually with texts usually with text from antiquity, our oldest copies were made a thousand years or more after the original document was penned. The Dead Sea Scrolls stand at least a millennium closer to the original authorship than the Aleppo Codex does. In addition, the Dead Sea Scrolls allow us to be confident that the Hebrew Scriptures in our Bibles really are the same as what Jesus or even Paul would have studied. The Dead Sea Scrolls, we know that the scribes were exceedingly careful in their work. We have to praise the scribes for their accuracy, but we shouldn't find it surprising either. These men weren't just copying works of great literature, they were copying what they believed to be the very words of God. From the time of Moses, God has been written down, reduced to stone tablet or paper form, so that everybody can see it, everybody can understand it, to stone tablet or paper has been written down. They were copying what they believed to be the very words of God. From the time of Moses, the Word of God has been written down, reduced to stone tablet or paper form, so that everybody can see it, everybody can understand it, everybody can follow it. The people at Qumran held up God's Word in great esteem, and they went to great lengths to preserve God's Word, and it's the same in the New Testament, where Jesus' words are written down, and the words of the apostles are written down, and they still form the very basis of our faith. They are our connection to Christ. What can we as Christians take away from studying the ancient community at Qumran, and what spiritual treasures can we discover? First, we have to get out into the world. When we look at the community that lived at Qumran, 
we see that they were intensely concerned with ritual purity. They observed it much more strictly than any other Jewish sect. They essentially withdrew into their own community in the wilderness and separated themselves from everyone else. We may feel a similar temptation in the church. We may be tempted to look at all the evil in the world and retreat inside the walls of the church using it as a safe haven or spiritual bunker. This may have been the mindset of the Qumran community, but it was the opposite of what Jesus taught. I am seeking out the very people that polite society would have labeled as socially undesirable. Alright, I want to show y'all this little article real quick. It's about the destruction of the, of the Jerusalem church in 70 AD. Alright, alright, check it out. Now these people, you can clearly see these, these Romans. You know, these not Israelites, but these Romans, you know. But well, let's scroll down real quick. I want to show you something. We all... Alright, hold on, let me see. I'm going to just uh, start up ahead. The Jews and the Romans always suspicious of one another were further were now further estranged and other incidents followed. Attacks on Roman citizens became more frequent. Gentiles for the part began to taunt their Jewish neighbors. In the year sixty six, some Greeks sacrificed birds in front of a synagogue while the Romans looked on and did nothing. Outrage, the temple priests put a stop to all sacrifices offered for a good for the good of Caesar. The Roman prosecutor pro, pro, procurator reacted by sending troops to the temple to make a huge withdrawal of gold from the treasury, a gift for the emperor. Now come war came war from the Roman perspective. It seemed to come from many directions. There were countless sales of disaffected men. The sects of warriors inspired by prophecy all closed in on imperial troops and government. So begun the bloodshed that came to be known as the First Roman Jewish War. Uh, uh, the war raged from 66 to 73. But it climax was a seven month siege of Jerusalem in the year 70, that's 70 AD. The Romans sealed off the city's supply route and stocked up its water supply. See, this is how they beat, beat them, strategize them. They cut off those city's supply routines and stocked up its water supply. By mid midsummer that year, the Romans had breached the walls and at the end of July, the city was in flames. See, on July 29th, the temple, Herod's grand, grand, Herod's grand reconstruction, which had only recently been complete, was destroyed. The Christians had long since left the city, warned by a prophecy given to the church. Both Christians and Jews came to the can't you see the destruction of Jerusalem as God's judgment on a sinful generation? At that point, however, the interpretation part parted ways for the Jews sacrificed seeds with the utter destruction and profanation of the temple for Christians. However, the age of pure sacrifice was just beginning. See, so it's showing a distinct difference between the Jews and the Christians, you know, the Jews and the teacher of righteousness, you know, and the man of sin and these Christians who, who started this false church. They call it that at Jesus' death, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. See, that's off. The temple thus had been decommissioned 
made obsolete by Jesus' sacrifice. See? See, this is that Christian stuff. Now the temple was Christ. See? So it's showing you that at first it wasn't Christ. It was Yahweh. You know? And the teacher of righteousness was teaching the Torah. But when these Christians came in, you know, and, and they cut off the water supplies and took over, you know, now the temple was Christ. Now the temple was his church. See? To so close the communion of Christ with his church, right? That the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it pro, was proclaimed in the ap ap apostolic, apostolic age, see? Because Paul and Timothy, these are the apostles. These are the false prophets, right? The apostolic age by the church through the ministers and mirrors. See that? But you see, you know, that the Romans, they wrote, raised war in the war from, from A.D. of 66 to 73. But a climax was a seven month siege of Jerusalem in the year 70, 70 A.D. See, the Romans still off all the city supply routes and stop up its water supply. You know, by midsummer that year, the Romans had breached the walls, and at the end of July, the city was in flames. See, so they they burnt the city and took all this treasury out of, out of her. And, and and the the people that didn't die and that didn't go into the Babylonian captivity. These is the ones who went into different regions. They the ones who scattered real quick. They, you know. So it's showing us right here in this article. And see, it's a Catholic exchange. The destruction of Jerusalem, see. So they telling you what happened. Even the Catholics telling you what happened. But our brothers, fellow Israelites, they just don't want to hear the truth. They don't like to hear the truth. You know, I this right here, you know, one of the brothers brought this out in a video, OTT brought this out in a video. I wanted to also bring it out in this video because this is the name of the slaves that was on the ships, you know, and this is, man, this is incredible. Like, you can see up here it says slavevoyages.org, so you see it, 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 links directly to the slaves and then I, I search Yah right here and you see the name that popped up the ship names the voice the gender the age look the name possible modern counterpart name and register so we was registered under these names as the slaves now check this out check this out yeah what did that say yeah. So it's showing this male, his name is Yah, right? On this ship. The virtue, the year 1833, African ID, 27 right? Then the next one, it says Yah again, 28, male, voice ID, 2479, Samaritan, 18, that's the ship name. The voice year 1835 African ID is what 339979. Here go the name. Yeah. Yeah. See, cause we was resident under the Yahoo, the Yahweh tribes, man. We was the Yahweh, Yahweh tribes. Look, I'm gonna go down and type this one. Uh, yeah. See. African name, Yah, and gender, male and female result. See, I did this like three hours ago. I put it up. You know what I'm saying? That's how long I've been trying to work on this video. I'm going to go to the next. Now check it out. All right, check this out. This male, this male, A7, right? Name, Maba, Ba. Voyage ID, 
is what 2346 Clara and Clarita that's the ship name right 1825 this is the year right African ID 6580 see because we come from the landmass but when you say the name this that's out bye bye see that you don't hear no you no no jaw none of that ya ba you know what I'm saying hold on let me go down a little bit go to the next one check this out alright check this out this a female the ship is Garcita the voice here 1836 African ID 37 023 name car Alright, so we're gonna play it and see what it sounds like. Can. See that? Can. So you don't hear no you hey you know what I'm saying? You don't hear none of that in none of these names. This another female down here, right? We're gonna play this female name, Iya. Right? And yeah. See that? You don't hear no use. And yeah. See what I'm talking about? So you're not finna get no you, you Yahoo and none of that, right? Check this out. Da, this a dude, this a male name. Da, you know, he was 16 years old, male, 7525. This is Voyager ID. Galandrina. It's the ship name. Uh, Voyager year was 1814. His African ID is 106. 457. Right? These are the Yahuda tribe. The Yahawa tribes, right? Check it out. Da. See? Da. See what I'm talking about? Well, yeah, you could come and check this out. It's AfricanOrigins.com. Got the talent, treat your mind Keep the door, y'all Let your light shine Elevate your mind You know it's only right I got the time If you got the talent, treat your mind Keep the door, y'all Let your light shine Elevate your mind You know it's only right